Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the annual John Paul II Lecture for Interfaith Understanding. I'm Rabbi Bert Vysotsky. I am the director of the Milstein Center for Interreligious Dialogue here at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. We are co-hosting this program, as we have for many years now, with the John Paul II Center of the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. And we especially want to thank the Russell Berry Foundation for their assistance in offering this program. I gratefully acknowledge the presence of Angelica Berry, who is somewhere on this Zoom call. I especially want to welcome the alumni of the John Paul II program, many of whom were my students when I taught there in 2014. I want to welcome members of Religions for Peace International and JTS students, supporters, and friends from all around the world. We had between somewhere between 450 and 500 registrations. And when I say all around the world, I mean quite literally from just about every region you can imagine. There will be some ground rules for this Zoom call, and I want to share them with you. Um, because we are a Je Jewish institution, we have had the unhappy opportunity of being Zoom bombed. So we are trying to prevent Zoom bombing, and we want everyone to be comfortable. And the first thing we're doing is, except for the speakers, everyone is on mute. I believe the general chat feature is locked, I think. But um, if you want to ask a question during the course of Professor Karam's lecture or afterward when I'm dialoguing with her for a little bit, you can use the chat feature. And if it works properly, it will go to the Milstein Center Programming Coordinator, Margot Hughes Robinson, who will uh, curate the audience questions and share them with me as moderator. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Margot, who not only has taken great care to make sure this would work, but even more so has been putting up with me, which is no small task. So let me repeat, to prevent Zoom bombing, there will be no screen sharing and no changing of names. And we hope that you understand these security measures. Now it is my pleasure to invite my friend, Ruth Salzman. Ruth is the CEO of the Russell Berry Foundation. She has held that job since 2008, and she will offer a few brief words of welcome from the Berry Foundation. Ruth? Thank you, Bert. The John Paul II Center also started in 2008 through a collaboration between the Russell Berry Foundation and the Angelicum, or University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. When the Berry Foundation began this journey, we would never have imagined we would be here today embarking on the 13th year and welcoming our 13th cohort of international fellows to Angelicum to study international dialogue at the graduate level. One of the Berry Foundation's mission areas is fostering religious understanding and pluralism. And we are very pleased through the John Paul II Center that we're able to partner with the Jewish Theological Seminary to sponsor this timely address by Dr. Karam, the General Secretary of Religions for Peace on Interreligious Cooperation and Global Well-Being. We all know what a perilous and frightening time this has been, a time of I, some isolation, polarization, and uncertainty, and her words will be more welcome than ever. I will also just take one moment to recognize that a giant of interreligious dialogue passed from our midst very, very recently, Dr. Rabbi Dr. Lord Jonathan Sachs. And I wanted to close with a quote of his that I find particularly resonant. By being what only I can be, I give humanity what only I can give. It is my uniqueness that allows me to contribute something unique to the universal heritage of humankind. And I sum it up, the Jewish imperative, very simply. And it, and it has been like this since the days of Abraham, to be true to your faith and a blessing to others, regardless of their faith. Thank you, Ruth. Um, I'm not used to 
being muted. So I'm a classroom professor. I tend to talk over everyone. But uh, I'm going to try and stay muted when it's not my turn. But I want to call now on Professor Adam Afterman to offer brief greetings from Jerusalem. Professor Afterman is the co-director of the John Paul II Center for Interreligious Dialogue, and he is the chair of the Department of Jewish Philosophy and Talmud at Tel Aviv University. He's speaking to us from Jerusalem. Adam, please. Thank you. Welcome from Jerusalem. Uh, the John Paul II Center is a collaboration between the Russell Berry Foundation and the Pontifical University of Thomas Aquinas, or the Angelicum in Rome. Rabbi Jack Bemparad's visionary leadership seeded this uh, fruitful collaboration. Our center seeks to provide the next generation of religious leaders with a comprehensive understanding of and a dedication of interfaith issues and action. We offer 10 annual Russell Berry Fellowships and interreligious dialogue at the Angelicum to emerging religious leaders for the purpose of furthering their knowledge of other religions, engaging with people of different faiths, and actively promoting interfaith dialogue in their communities. We support a network of more than 100 John Paul II Center leaders, the graduates of our program, engage in different levels of dialogue and bridge building projects in over 35 countries in the world. We also cultivate partnerships with other like-minded organizations and networks to amplify our connections and impact in fostering religious pluralism throughout the world. That's why we're so pleased that each year our center is able to sponsor a program in partnership with the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, Milstein Center for Interreligious Dialogue, to bring the vows of religious pluralism to broader audience. I'm honored this evening to welcome you tonight on behalf of the John Paul II Center. I wanna thank the Jewish Theological Seminary and Rabbi Burt personally for their partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And I, I do want to recognize, Adam uh, mentioned the co-director and the founding director, Rabbi Jack Bemparad. Um, Jack is on this Zoom call, and I also want to give my thanks to uh, Rabbi Bemparad for his leadership and his vision. He's been a real exa example for me of how to live in the interfaith dialogue space, and I'm appreciative of that. Now we turn to hear the address of my friend and my rabbi, Aza Karam. Um, Professor Aza Karam is the new Secretary General of Religions for Peace International. Religions for Peace is the largest interfaith organization in the world. It is in 90 countries and six regions. In addition to being the Secretary General of, it, of Religions for Peace, Professor Karam is, in fact, Professor of Religion and Development at the Freie Universität in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Professor Karam served as Senior Advisor on Culture at the United Nations Population Fund and as Chair of the United Nations Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development. There, she coordinated engagement with over 600 faith-based organizations. In that role, Professor Karam also founded the UN Multi-Faith Advisory Council, and I'm proud to say that the Milstein Center for Interreligious Dialogue is a member of that council. Aza Karam was the lead facilitator in the United Nations Strategic Learning Exchanges on Religion, Development, and Diplomacy, building on a legacy of serving as a facilitator in intercultural leadership. And again, I'm proud to say that the Jewish Theological Seminary has had the privilege, thanks to Dr. Karam, of hosting the UN Strategic Learning Exchanges. Following Dr. Karam's address, I will engage her in some conversation, and then, assuming some questions come in to Margot in the chat, we will uh, also ask her audience questions. I will be do the one asking those questions, though. Please send them to Margot. Use your chat function to send in your questions. And now, Professor Karam, the screen is yours. Thank you very, very much, um, Rabbi 
Vysotsky. Um, you are my rabbi, in fact, and I'm very, very honored with that very delightful uh, and very generous introduction. Um, I am deeply honored and very, very thrilled with the invitation that I received to speak at this, uh, what I consider to be a very prestigious and momentous uh, lecture, John Paul II lecture in interreligious understanding. I am very grateful to the co-sponsors, uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, the John Paul II Interfaith Center at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome, as well as grateful to the generous support of the Russell Berry Foundation to make all this possible. But I am most especially grateful to Rabbi Burton Vysotsky in person and his wondrous team at JTS, Dr. Ruth Salzman and Professor Efterman. Thank you. And I am very grateful to all who are brave enough to have registered to listen to me speak today. Let me give you a bit of an idea of what I intend to do so that you'll understand the flow of the next few minutes. And then you can always, of course, decide to tune off whenever you've heard your piece and that's it. I'd like to be able to first explain what on earth I mean by the title of my lecture, which is a dialogue of love and looking at inter or multi-religious cooperation and global well-being. So I'll explain some of the terms that I'm using and what I mean by them. I then will go to sharing some of the highlights of the work that I did at the United Nations in service to this dialogue of love, because I believe that the dialogue of love is the whole purpose of interreligious or multi-religious cooperation, actually, um, for the sake of global well-being. I, I see them, I see the dialogue of love as the multi-religious cooperation for global well-being. I'll speak about what I consider to be then coming home. I immigrated to the United States in October of 2000 to work in Religions for Peace. I left behind a very fine job and settled opportunity, but I wanted very much, and with a passion I, which has grown over the years, to serve interreligious collaboration. So I, when I left Religions for Peace in 2004 to join the United Nations Development Program at that time, the intention was to continue this dialogue of love. Um, but I found out very quickly, as I will share with you later, that it was not the easiest thing to do in the United Nations. And that's why I'm using the work of the United Nations as, if you will, a prototype of some of the challenges, but also the joys of this dialogue of love. So I'll speak a little bit to having worked in this space of the United Nations, but also then coming back home, which is to me, Religions for Peace. Um, and what this now means, what this dialogue of love, this labor of love actually looks like and what it means and what are some of the challenges, but also the opportunities that I believe a space like Religions for Peace and its mission effectively mirrored in so many other faith-based organizations and entities, what does that actually look like? What does it mean? And I will conclude with saying a few words on basically the love of the divine, service to the divine in this inter or multi-religious encounter. And I will mention terms like spiritual dignity and permanent empathy. So that gives you a bit of, a pro uh, of an overview of what I'm going to share with you. This is now a good moment to turn off or to leave if you don't like any of it. What do I mean by some of the terminology that I'm using? So first of all, religions, I mean, it's used so loosely. As intended here, it refers to the realms inclusive of religious leaders, diverse religious leaders, religious institutions, religious communities, religiously inspired non-governmental organizations, or in the US context, they are known as not-for-profits. All of this realm, religious leaders, religious institutions, religious communities, religiously inspired NGOs, this is all the realms of religion um, that are often referred to and encompassed in that one term, religion or religions. So clearly these realms are quite vast and therefore difficult to speak of in a sort of a universalized, generalized, or God forbid, essentialized manner. And yet the mistake is often made to speak of religion and development, religion and gender, religion and environment, religion and foreign policy, and so on. This form of essentialization creates multiple opportunities for misunderstanding, especially, albeit not only, when implicit or explicit references are made to terrorism, fundamentalism, political violence as part of this religion and mix. So things just get more complicated and mired in complexity and lack of clarity when we actually refer to all of these things under the simple term of religion. For the purpose of clarification, bear with me though, having made all that um, uh, clarity, bear with me as I too sometimes slip into this faux pas. Um, I'm trying to share experiential narratives with you um, as a development practitioner, as a former diplomat, um, 
literally as somebody who's been working in the realms of human rights for many, many years, um, and as a scholar, frankly, of religion and development and of the United Nations, I try often unsuccessfully to do both the work itself and then think about it and try to analyze it. Kindly note, I did say the word unsuccessfully. So I'm trying and I certainly haven't got it right. And I'm hoping that you can push back in the questions later. But what do I mean by global well-being? Bear with me a second as I try to explain this realm. Amartya Sen, who most of you know, is a Nobel laureate for economics, was credited with saying that, and I quote, economic growth without investment in human development is unsustainable and unethical. Yet for much of the last century, the most common measurement of people's well-being has been focused on money using measures like the gross domestic product or GDP. However, over time, more and more organizations and even one country like Bhutan around the world are today measuring well-being or trying to measure well-being in a different way. In other words, using data beyond global the GDP to look at wider social and environmental measures as well as economic ones. So not letting go of the economic ones, but trying to expand to include social and environmental spaces. In their Global Analysis of Wellbeing report uh, of 2017, the Oxford Foundation for Knowledge Exchange considered some of the ways, the different ways that well-being is actually being measured. Early concerns about measurement of well-being focus on the environmental and social consequences of economic activity that were not well reflected by monetary measures. Two approaches have emerged as increasingly important in economic work. One, which was developed by the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, which attempts to reorient analysis to measuring the quality of life. The formation of this took part soon after the United Nations Human Development Index was launched. And this became one of the first successful international efforts to go beyond measuring well-being through GDP, gross domestic product. A second approach to measuring well-being, which attracts both research as well as policy circles, is work that focuses on subjective assessments of well-being. Okay, so there are a number of measures or variables that have been used, ranging from satisfaction with life to overall anxiety. This approach to measuring well-being requires basically seven features. One is taking multiple domains into account when measuring the quality of life. You look at work, you look at family, you look at home, community, physical environment. Two, factoring in multiple stakeholders. So people in their roles as citizens and or service consumers. And I'm going to add a, a, another category, which is immigrants and internally displaced peoples. Three, involving the whole of the life cycle, all age groups in these different settings, work, family, home, community, physical environment. Four, reviewing abilities and constraints. If you're going to look at work, family, home, environment, and multiple stakeholder, you have to also look at what seems to be working, what isn't particularly working, what are some of the challenges. Five is use the, using measures of happiness. What makes you happy? And so you can already begin to see the complexity of trying to make, keep track of all that, and yet the enormous wealth of opportunity in doing this. Six is using data developed by the people being assessed themselves, as opposed to our usual trying to figure out things for people, measurements and indicators for people. This particular approach to well-being is actually trying to look at what you think the data should be, what you think matters, how you see things, being as you're being measured and your well-being is being measured. And the seventh is basically an understanding that standardizing some of these measures at both national and international levels is going to have to be necessary, which is where you come into subjective versus objective. But the standardizing of some of these measures, because the whole point is to facilitate international comparisons. With these seven points in mind, I maintain an added aspect relevant, relevant to bringing about, how do we bring about well-being? Okay, so here's the measuring, but then how do you actually bring about the measurement of well-being? And this is something that I want to relate to the notion of universal peace. Okay, what do I mean by that? This one is pretty straightforward because actually universal peace is enshrined in the United Nations Charter. Article one, 
where the purpose of the United Nations are identified, specifically the parts that make sense to me that I'm drawing on here is that universal peace means the development of friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples and to take other appropriate measures to strengthen universal peace. That's the foundation of what the United Nations is supposed to be. In addition to that, the Article 1 continues, to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems of an economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian character, and in promoting and encouraging respect for human rights and for fundamental freedoms for all without distinctions as to race, sex, language, or religion. The other aspect of this Article 1 of the very purpose of the United Nations is that the United Nations is meant to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations in the attainment of these common ends. So with a view to universal peace as a frame of how you can actually try to bring about this measure of happiness and therefore of well-being, I am therefore understanding and approaching the work of interreligious cooperation or partnerships with and between religious actors around peace and security, human rights, and sustainable development through that lens. Well-being is a task with which we are all mandated as humans in our respective faith traditions as well as belief systems, for sure. But I see that the United Nations, particularly its work in and with religion and with faith-based organizations, to be important influencers and detractors of interreligious collaboration. In other words, the ways in which the United Nations system and faith-based actors interact and engage can determine many aspects of global well-being. I believe, and I know that this is now deeply problematic for many, but I actually believe in the values of the United Nations, and I believe in the values that the United Nations is meant to uphold, defend, and seek to implement. Universal human rights. And I believe that these values are inherent in each and all faith traditions. Indeed, they emanate from that which is common to all faith traditions. I also believe that if we did not have the United Nations system today, we would have probably needed to build it or something pretty much like it. I'm not sure, however, that with our current geopolitical, financial, and global health dynamics, including the health, by the way, of our very environment, not just our health and COVID, the very environment, the health of our environment, I'm not sure that if we were to try to build the United Nations system today, that we could. So I'm actually really grateful that it exists already. As a veteran of the struggle to enlighten within the United Nations system on the why and how of engaging with religious actors for two decades, I will therefore begin by situating the dialogue of love which unfolded and continues to unfold as multi-religious collaboration through, through reviewing what was done in and through the United Nations system. I actually have a few quotes in my presentation that come straight out of Alice in Wonderland, because I happen to believe that that book is a fantastic background to the lives we're living today. Institutions, individuals, you name it. So when I'm looking at the highlights of the United Nations work with religious actors, especially in the last decades, the quote that I'm using is one of my favorite from Alice in Wonderland, which is curiouser and curiouser. In the United Nations, which is a distinct galaxy of stars, 193 government members set the political tones. These are internally losing plenty of institutional credibility in and among their own populations. In fact, there's probably a very few number of what the 193 nations that still have a very powerful, uh, legitimate structure and social contract with their citizens. A lot, many aspects of those social contracts between governments and citizens are today being frayed at the edges pretty seriously. In some countries, they are frayed very, very seriously. 
The coronavirus has seriously attacked this pre-existing condition of institutional weakness and loss of credibility and legitimacy of governance and governments. And it has rendered many of these governments even weaker and more heavily dependent on the security ventilators of armies and police. Even the most democratic among these governments is struggling to uphold a passable record of human rights observance, let alone human well-being. I need not go too far to give an example of this. The country I have ch chosen to be my own is indeed going through the throes of that. The countries I am born in is going and has been going through the throes of that loss of legitimacy for institutional governance credibility. When these governments come together in the United Nations, especially in its key decision-making body, the Security Council, these group of governments basically set the political tones, which I'm sorry to say are seriously discordant, rather out of tune, and quite frankly, gut-wrenching. There's little music in that space. There is very little in the form of principled politics that is sometimes worth listening to in some of these spaces. All the more reason then actually to appreciate the tunes, the cadence, the rhythm that is actually harmonious within such a space because you're so used to the discordant dynamics that when you see them coming together around something, it's absolutely amazing. And that, by the way, this absolutely amazing is what I see as the United Nations General Assembly adopting after years of work behind the scenes, research, analysis, engagement with civil society, engagement with scientific actors, you name it. To see them meet to adopt the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 is and was absolutely amazing. And I will remember to the day I die, seeing very, very senior, serious people represent full suits, full regalia, having struggled so hard to come to that moment, I remember those serious people with tears running down their face the moment that the Sustainable Development Goals agenda was adopted. It isn't only because of what that agenda upholds and maintains. It was also the struggle to actually come together as 193 governments and accept it and agree that all, each and all, will be held accountable to this agenda. By now, we're a bit blasé. We're looking at corona and feeling that everything that we have is in tatters. But we mustn't forget that there is this global agenda that, that should help us stay together, that should help us stay true to what it is that we're supposed to deliver on for our governments and our citizens. One of the things about the Sustainable Development Goals agenda is that, yes, in addition to its incredible significance, it actually puts into measurable bits and pieces all the objectives of the three main foundations of what the United Nations system itself is supposed to uphold, maintain, and serve. Now, remember, I'm using universal peace, which is the United Nations system's Article 1 commitment. So here is a Sustainable Development Agenda goals 17 which actually capture in numbers in words and numbers what it is that this universal peace should look like in the next well now it's in the next 10 years but then it was in 2015 it was actually in the next 30 years part of the reason that the sustainable development goals are also referred to as agenda 2030 is because they're not limited to human development read things like health education nutrition sanitation poverty housing employment water land etc but they also encompass all aspects of life on the planet they also encompass how it is that we try to build peaceful just and inclusive societies how it is that air land and water have to be protected and what biodiversity is and means. They also encompass the modus operandi to realize these critical pillars of universal peace, human development, peace and security, and human rights, which is what the, United, the three legs of the United Nations and the three legs of universal peace. This 
modus operandi that is captured within the Sustainable Development Goals with clear indicators is partnerships. Therefore, we actually have a goal that measures how we are supposed to be walking this journey and enacting this dialogue of love globally, universally. Partnerships has to be and is the way to go. In other words, cooperation and collaboration are no longer something that we, gee, wouldn't it be nice to do, but they are actually mandated and tracked and measured and governments have agreed to hold themselves accountable to that. And that means that their civil society, their citizens can hold them accountable to that as well, to those partnerships as well. So that's why I'm sharing with you here how the UN system, they're engaged with religious voices, right, around peace and peace building. And I'm going to speak to the processes which took place in and around Agenda 2030. So, why would an entity like the United Nations see the value of religions, you may ask. I consider, I've, I've limited to like six themes, six main reasons of why religious actors, now remember I said religious actors or religious institutions, religious leaders, religious communities, religious NGOs or not-for-profits. Why should the UN see this this space, this realm that makes the UN so tiny, why should the UN see this space as significant? Six reasons. One, religious actors are social and cultural gatekeepers in all societies, even in the most secular society, religious institutions, religious actors remain social and cultural gatekeepers. In fact, any transformation in behaviors and attitudes, social and cultural norms, somehow has to do at some point in time with religious leaders and their institutions speaking from their respective pulpits and advocating for those changes or advocating against them. And I think the process of the US elections was a wonderful mirror of how you see both sides. Ultimately, even though it's about governance, even though it's about so many issues, ultimately things to do with behaviors and attitudes do somehow manage to pass through that particular gate of religious leaders and actors. Apart from Western Europe, the rest of the world has maintained faith as a central part of how people think, believe, and behave. For too long, though, the UN system has operated, and to some extent still does, like other intergovernmental actors, the European Union is a clear example, but others as well. But for too long, these systems have operated with a Western European mindset which can be extremely frustrating sometimes because these are institutions that bring together people of the world and the cultures of the world and the behaviors of the world, but they still have a particular mindset, modus operandi, that is Western European in orientation, which is part of the explanation for why they've resisted seeing the value added of religions for quite some time. Two, religious institutions, churches, mosques, temples, synagogues, are the largest, oldest, and most far-reaching social service providers. They serve, people's, they serve people's needs in almost every area of development, health, education, nutrition, sanitation, environmental conservation, governance, you name it. Where did we find the oldest hospitals, hospices, and clinics? In churches, mosques, and temples. Where are the oldest schools still today? In churches, mosques, and synagogues, and temples, etc. Three, religious institutions and religiously inspired NGOs or faith-based organizations are the first responders in humanitarian crises. At least four out of the top 10 global humanitarian NGOs are religiously inspired. And religious sites are often the go-to spaces in natural or man-made humanitarian crises. For those of you living in New York, you may recall that there was a massive tent set up right smack inside Central Park when New York City was the epicenter of the COVID crisis. That massive tent was an ICU, intensive care unit. It was set up in Central Park because of the overflow from the private hospitals, the government run hospitals and every other hospital there is. And it was set up by a faith-based organization. It was necessary, it was needed, and it wasn't the only thing that that faith-based set of actors set up and delivered in Geneva 
in the first wave, we knew that Caritas, which is a Catholic NGO, was actually feeding 5,000 people a day at one point. Geneva, Switzerland, quite well off. The point here is when crises strike, any kind of humanitarian crises, religious actors are the first responders and they stay, they're there before, they're there during, and they're there well after. Four, religious leaders in their capacity as leaders of major religious institutions and communities are in many parts of the world today, as we can still see around us, I keep saying, rather heavily vested actors in and with politicians, politics and political parties, and political leaders in many parts of the world. Religious leaders are partners in actions and, in, and sometimes they're spiritual advisors and or inciters of political actions alongside political parties and politicians. That's just a truth. Five, religious institutions, as well as many religiously affiliated or inspired NGOs, are among the most creatively self-resourced institutions in the world. Let me say that again. They're amongst the most creatively self-resourced institutions in the world. Their networks of volunteers, human resources, as well as their fundraising capacities, their financial resources, far outweigh any other secular NGO counterpart, with the exception, of course, of global corporations. You need to just think of charitable donations in so many contexts, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu. Think of Islamic zakat, Islamic finance, as well as the Vatican Bank. We need to appreciate, quite frankly, that religious institutions are not always the poorest of the poor actors. But even when they are, they can still rely on remarkable resources to serve the needs that they have. Six, last but by no means least, if and when religions are identified as the source of terrorism, violence, extremism, what have you, and if religious reasons are given as reasons to either ignore international human rights, norms and laws, or to violate any of them, then how can religious actors not be engaged? If some of those realms are the cause or source of harm and pain, how can we not seek to find the remedies within them? Now, caveat, the usual pushback to this particular rationale is often to note the fact that not all religious actors work in accordance with all human rights, which is very true. In fact, some may be perceived as working to actively counteract some human rights, particularly on matters relating to human sexuality, such as gender identity, sexual and reproductive health, women's leadership of religious congregations, etc. While this is true in some cases and in some religious spaces, remember I'm not just talking about one religious country or one religious context. I am looking at the realms of the world of religion. So this reality is precisely why the engagement of religion and engaging with the realms of religion, which is far bigger, wider, and more diverse than any other realm of human existence, cannot and should not be ruled out. Rather, any engagement of the religious actors has to be considered cautious and principled. Secular institutions seek to work, or they should seek to work, with religious actors whose work affirms the values and intersections with human rights. The fact is, that all human rights as we know them are actually derived from the values common to all religious traditions. I am repeating this. Moreover, those religious actors who see and struggle for human rights, and I'm convinced that those are the majority even if they don't self-identify as such, let me say that again. I am convinced that the majority of religious actors are actually seeing and struggling for human rights. These are also the ones who can articulate those rights and advocate for them most efficiently and effectively amongst all communities, since they are spoken of and served as part of religious values and commitments. The challenge is that some religious institutions and religious leaders can often make a claim to exceptionalism, which is supposed to position them above the responsibilities and obligations enshrined in international human rights law. But this claim to exceptionalism is understandable because holy scriptures have actually long predated any and all human rights as articulated today. We know this. 
And by the way, these holy scriptures will outlive any and all legislation that we have today, anywhere in the world. Nevertheless, this claim to exceptionalism should not nullify the fact that all of humanity's actions require a temporal method of judgment, a standard, if you will. And this standard cannot vary by interpretation of diverse religious scriptures or traditions. These standards have to apply to all who live in and on this planet, which is dynamically and irremediably and eternally codependent. These standards are our international yardstick. That's human rights. And they are therefore the foundation for global law and order. And they are the foundation for global well-being. Where and when religious reasons are used to oppress, subordinate, or mete out any injustice or violate the dignity of any human being and their required necessary ecosystem, these reasons are not consonant with international human rights norms and standards. Therefore, they are not consonant with global well-being. Full stop. Religions for Peace is worldview, mirroring my own deeply held convictions and acted upon for half a century is this, oppression, subordination, injustice, and any and all violations of human dignity and damage to our ecosystem are inconsistent with both the letter and the spirit of religious doctrines themselves. No religion advocates for the indignity of a fellow human being or for the destruction of the very livelihood of all humankind. That is our natural ecosphere. At the same time, no amount of secular argumentation and dedicated service to communities and nations working alone and without alignment with diverse religious institutions has been sufficient to eradicate the multiple forms of oppression and injustice perpetuated over decades. It hasn't worked. It's not been enough to talk about human rights and law and norms and order. Racism and extremism are a case in point. More dangerously, when and where we leave religious institutions and actors marginalized, many of these communities can also become marginalizing. You see, the fact is that religious institutions are actually quite habituated to power, political, social, and economic, since time immemorial. Rationally speaking, if you've been the source of social service to your communities, if you have these creative access of trying to raise resources for yourselves, you're actually quite used to being in power. Power isn't an anomaly for religious actors and institutions. For secular actors, therefore, to believe that they can set aside the religious realms or use the on a need to basis only theology for engagement, that bespeaks an attitude of arrogance and ignorance. Instead, the dialogue and praxis of working with religious actors actually is a sine qua non of human and environmental sustainability. And it is only when we engage in conversation, discussions, debates, and actual partnerships to serve together that we build collectively owned social capital, as we also establish a more knowledgeable, inclusive, and effective capacitation of all institutions, secular and religious. This is the required global infrastructure we need to ensure all human rights are protected. We can't work secular to protect human rights only. We have to work both the religious and the secular in order to protect human rights. Keeping human rights as the focus of principled engagement means we are working towards the same ends. By working with religious actors, we widen the circle of mutual understanding of one another's worldviews as well as modes of operation. We reach more people in our respective societies, and we can then actually, realistically, build back better, as we're hearing today. If the COVID pandemic is teaching us one thing, it is this. None of our existing infrastructure in any country is actually sufficient to deal with the multiple and escalating challenges in a siloed manner. Each of our institutions working in our own spaces and old ways is nowhere near enough to stem the infections nor the deaths. Time for a different set of approaches. 
Sustainable Devo Development Goal number 17 provides a clarion call for the means of operation. Partnerships across all sectors, all nations, and all institutions. Now, Sustainable Development Goal 17, therefore, is one of Religious for Peace's top six priorities. The other five are also fully consonant with the rest of the Sustainable Development Goals agenda. The religious institutions who are represented in Religions for Peace adopted the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals priorities, and some of the indicators as their own in the strategic plan that we now have from 2020 to 2025. In short, COVID has required an adaptation of the modus operandi of this unique global movement with over 90 interreligious councils in countries. The adaptation took the form of a multi-religious humanitarian fund. This is where Religious for Peace has provided a mechanism to put its money where its mouth is. Encouraging, requiring, requesting, cajoling, collaboration across religious silos and providing the seed support to help this to be, to be done. When I joined the UNDP in 2004, I was told that, quote, we don't do religion. So it took a while to try to explain and understand those six points that I shared with you over a course of many years. In 2007, I joined UNFPA, the UN Population Fund. Why? Because it had an, a, a position called advisor on culture. And why then culture? Because this was the way, this was as close as a UN system entity was going to come to naming the religious realms as part of the, of the cultural realms and creating a position that was meant to serve that multi-religious space for human rights. I worked with my colleagues across the UN system especially in UNFPA, to set up the first global forum on strengthening partnerships for sustainable development. That took place in 2008. It was the first time that the United Nations hosts faith-based non-governmental organizations, religious leaders from across the world, after it had decided to host them in the millennium with a thousand religious leaders from around the world. It took from 2000 to 2008 to do the next hosting of global religious actors in the UN. Tells you something about the way that the UN operates sometimes. In 2008, I was able to work with my colleagues in UNAIDS to develop the very first strategy on engaging with faith-based actors around prevention and treatment of HIV and AIDS. Why HIV and AIDS, you, you may think. Those of you who have worked in this space for many years know that this was the moment when global consciousness was set on discrimination and stigmatization of HIV AIDS. HIV positive folks. This was where clearly the religious realms were a source of intense stigmatization and discrimination against those who were living with this. Therefore, in the uh, journey, in the struggle to overcome stigma and discrimination, religious institutions were a primary go-to and working partner. That began an entire process of engaging with religious actors on almost everything else. Because in order to talk about HIV and AIDS and to start engaging about it, we had to talk about some of the most, the biggest taboos that we know. Sex, sexuality, who we have sex with, how that happens, because transmission of HIV happened in many ways also through there. So this began an incredible opportunity to research and work together. By the end of my journey in the United Nations, I calculated conservatively that per year, I served the UN system in organizing an average of about 10 to 12 consultations, either conferences, seminars, or policy roundtables, including at least one training, strategic learning exchange, with, which had an average of about 70 UN and faith-based participants. I advised between five and seven diverse FBO partners and at least five of the United Nations system entities, on a regular monthly basis. And I prepared several reports for the UN system. When I joined Religions for Peace, here are some of the lessons that were very fundamental for us to learn about multi-religious collaboration and engagement. Lesson one that actually is very pertinent to a number of other governments, especially in the Western Hemisphere, is the following, that we're still focused when we think religion, we're still focused on the Christian hemisphere. That 75% of those we work with tend to be Christian in nature and structure. That's not multi-religious. 
that is ecumenical at best. It is not multi-religious. And this feature remains something that needs to be improved. And this is one of the reasons why it's extremely important to work with a multi-religious lens and why it was important to set up not only an interagency task force inside the UN system that was working with these different religious actors and putting together a global database, but it was extremely important to set up the Multi-Faith Advisory Council because what that did is it pro provided us with an opportunity to bring the diverse religious actors around the table whom the UN could vet would defend in case of an issue, but also have these people on an equal partnership basis. They were peers, they are peers to the UN system so that they can advise at the same time. Dr. Karam, I wanna interrupt you because um, first of all, I'm getting many, many wonderful questions. Second okay. of all, I wanna point out that on the call, on the Zoom, there are mm -hmm. in fact many members of the United Nations Interfaith Advisory Council, and I want to welcome all of them. Um, if I may engage you a little bit, but before sure. I do that, first mm -hmm. I want to thank you for that, um, I don't know what you call this, a 30,000 foot view. Mm -hmm. uh, it's both academic and yet immediately accessible, and I think all of us understand much better how the United Nations works with religion, and indeed, I want to say this if it's not clear to anyone, that the fact that the United Nations works with religion is almost entirely due to you. And we are very grateful to you for that. Your efforts have been nonstop and they have borne fruit. But now you are the Secretary General of Religions for Peace. And I don't know if everyone on the call knows the basic background of RFP. Can you give us an idea? What are the countries, what are the regions, and what, what does RFP do on the ground? So Religions for Peace was set up 50 years ago by a group of religious leaders from all across the different religious spectrums and religious institutions. If there's one thing to distinguish Religions for Peace, there's two key things that one should know about Religions for Peace. Number one, it's the United Nations of Religions. Just like the United Nations has governments, Religions for Peace has religious institutions as its members and its constituents and its frame, and also representatives of religious communities and a grassroots network of youth and women from around the world. Um, it's present in 92 countries in every region of the world, um, and it's growing. So we just added a, a, we're very thrilled to have just added a, a, a counterpart um, in the Palestinian territories. Um, we're, con we're continuing to grow that space of interreligious collaboration. So it is not, it is a UN of religion because it has the institutions plus the civil society spaces of religious engagement, particularly youth and women. And it is it has country level presence. Each country level presence is an interreligious council. So it's the religious institutions of that particular country and the representatives of religious communities coming together. They don't just come and talk. It's a dialogue of love that is implemented, enacted through concrete programs and projects and initiatives. Some of the interreligious councils in some countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, tend to be a lot bigger than Religions for Peace headquarters in mm -hmm. New York um, and have a great many uh, range of engagements. Honestly, some of them are really small and working on very specific and limited areas. So they, they vary enormously from country to country per the conditions in those countries, per the needs, uh, humanitarian, developmental, political, peace building, it depends on the context of the country. The, inter the Religions for Peace Interreligious Councils mirror and serve those particular countries and their needs. Where the governments have a very strong relationship with religious institutions, the Religions for Peace Interreligious Councils in those countries tend to be extremely well positioned, very active in a number of areas. Where the governments have problems with the religious institutions, the Religions for Peace Interreligious Council tends to reflect those particular challenges of interreligious collaboration. I, I appreciate that. And having worked with you for many years, I, I appreciate the ways in which that mirrors some of the UN issues as well. Each country has its own, if I can use the Yiddish word, surus, its own troubles. And those troubles are reflected not only in the governments, but in the non-governmental organizations and the religious organizations. I wanna to come to a, a UN entity that you and I have both worked with, and that's the World Bank. A number of years ago, I met you for the first time sitting across the table 
in Washington at a World Bank roundtable of religious leaders. The mm -hmm. then president of the World Bank, Jim Young Kim, thought that there was wisdom, the same wisdom that you had been pro pro proposing at the UN, that there was wisdom in bringing religious leaders together to help the World Bank in its work. At the time, Jim Kim said that they had reduced extreme poverty around the globe by almost 50%, and that they hoped in the next five to 10 years to be able to continue to reduce that kind of extreme poverty that's living on under $2 a day. That's extreme poverty. Yeah. Um, that he hoped to continue. However, COVID-19 has absolutely destroyed economies around the world. And in that destruction of economies, more and more people have fallen back into extreme poverty. So first of all, is there anything the World Bank can do? But second of all, is there anything, whether it's Religions for Peace or the range of religious organizations on this Zoom call, is there anything we can be doing to help the poorest of the poor? Yes. Um, first of all, the World Bank cannot do this on its own, and it can't, and most certainly it's not going to be able to do it on its own. So therefore, the, the, the prescription of collaboration with other international actors and governments becomes ever more serious. The idea that we can continue working as business as usual, as I said before, is absolutely untenable. In other words, World Bank does World Bank things, UNDP does UNDP things, EU does EU things. That formula, quite frankly, is not going to work to face what we are all facing today. So the partnerships has to be a very critical part of that engagement. On the interreligious side, with all humility, we cannot point any fingers towards the World Bank or the UNDP or anybody else, because if we look at our own infrastructure of collaboration within the, inter within the religious world, it's pretty pathetic. Well, I'm sorry to say, but we're not doing a very good job of working together. We have much more to do to collaborate with one another, actively collaborate. And that was the call. And that was the lesson learned from religious for peace to say, okay, here's a multi-religious humanitarian support fund. Can we all pool a little bit of our resources together to serve together? This is actually, communities need exactly the same thing. They need food, they need shelter, they need water, they need somebody to care after them, especially if they're living on their own. They need masks, they need protective equipment. Come on, it's, it's, it, everybody needs the same things here from spiritual to absolutely practical. Can we do, and we're all working in those same communities. All these religious organizations are the first responders serving the same communities all over the world. Can we maybe work together to in amplify the resources and the way that they're reaching communities so that even that, that one ICU unit that was set up by a particular faith-based organization could have been set up not only in the name of that one organization, but could have been set up in the name of many religious actors and institutions, so that as, as subliminally at least, we're also sowing the seeds of understanding amongst the average person that religions can work together, that they do work together. It's not about the Catholics becoming more powerful or the Protestants becoming more powerful through service, because service does make you more powerful. It's not about the Jews or the Muslims becoming more powerful. It's actually about us changing minds about what religions can do together because it's in the same service to that dialogue of love that we absolutely require and that that social cohesion is actually something we need to aspire to even as we serve today as we serve in this moment we are thinking already with a lens towards the kind of future that is a post-COVID scenario. And if we're not sowing the seeds of our social cohesiveness today, we're actually sowing the seeds of social dismemberment today, precisely by having specific religious institutions serve communities. So what better way to serve social cohesion than to work co collaboratively at this point? So yes, that's what we have to do. That's the formula, work together. So I, what I'm hearing, though, uh, someone asked me specifically the question, can individual groups, people on the call, can they bring their church, their synagogue, whatever, to be engaged with religions for peace? And I'm sure that is the case on a country by country level. But yes. what I'm also hearing you say is that um, we may be able to do a good deal of work even without religions for peace. In other words, if you're a church, reach out to your local mosque, synagogue, et cetera, your Buddhist Absolutely. temple, and work Absolutely. together. That um, I'm reminded Absolutely. of um, the Cardinal Archbishop of New York, Timothy Dolan, mm -hmm. who is a man who politically I probably disagree with on everything. Mm -hmm. And yet we get along very well 
because Dolan once said to me, you know, Rabbi, for 2,000 years, when church and synagogue had dialogue, it was a dialogue of grievance. And now we are in a position to move past that. Mm -hmm. And we, we can have a dialogue of love, exactly, a dialogue of love, where church and synagogue can put aside our enmity and work to do so many things that Judaism, Christianity, Islam, you name the religion, they all agree, uh, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, finding shelter for people. And if we do that as groups, that is a very, very powerful thing. Um, there is a, sorry to interrupt you, Bert, but there's a very no. important Go dynamic ahead. aspect to this. Multi-religious collaboration is a call to action to every single religious institution, leader, community, etc. There are lessons to be learned from a legacy of working multi-religiously, however, because it's not just, okay, let's do this tomorrow. Hey, how about that? It doesn't quite work like that. Otherwise, we would have been synergized very nicely quite some time ago. The issue is that there are parameters there are lessons, there are codes of conduct, there are needs, there are requirements for multi-religious collaboration. A dialogue of love needs a framework for that love to grow and to be nurtured. That framework is what inter-religious organizations bring to the table. And that is precisely the value added of working with and within inter-religious structures. It's not because that's the only way to do it. It's because you can see from a legacy, in this case of 50 years or 100 years, you can see what some of the best ways of doing things are. You can also see what you really need to avoid. In that urge to be together, there are some things you need to be careful about and to avoid. And that you can only learn from a legacy of interreligious collaboration yes. that certain institutions have and bring to the table. Uh, to which I say, I mean, I mean, but um, one of the questions here, I, I think, touches on a real issue that religion faces, and it may be part of the reason even that for many years the UN kept it at arm's length. You and I both know that there are religious actors who don't act out of love, that they preach hate, and they foment violence, and particularly, they often foment violence against other religions. Is there a way that either the UN or Religions for Peace or any of us on this call can stand up? against terrorism, literally without losing our heads? I think the point here is to, again, it's a reiteration of what was said before. The beauty of having the Multi-Faith Advisory Council is as a service to the United Nations system is precisely because you're creating that mechanism that is there. There's a collaboration supposedly happening between the different members in order to advise the United Nations as to what best ways to do to deal with some of this hate speech that is being promoted through certain religious actors and organizations, how to deal with bridging the gap created between communities as a result of the pain suffered from actions inflicted by certain religious actors or communities or those speaking in the name of religions. The point is to be able to work together collaboratively to advise the United Nations system. And that's why COVID has done us all a tremendous favor, if I may say so, because now the turn from within governments and intergovernmental entities like the United Nations towards the religious communities is very definite. There's no question anymore about whether and how. The question is, who can we engage with? How can we make sure that we work with religious actors and leaders? Because you realize that if you're going to counter the discourse of hate, you can, of course, continue to do it through, legal, through secular legislation and arguments and, and civic engagement. But the best way to counter the dialogue of hate is to work with the religious leaders who are themselves and the religious institutions who are themselves able to find within the same religious theology and within the theology of multi-religious uh, actions and narratives to find that counter, to insist on it, and to continue to provide together, to work together. So it's not just the words, it's not just the advocacy, it's actually serving together in order to show very clearly that there is an alternative that is workable, that is normal, that is widespread, that is multi-religious, that is all the divine speaking and serving together. To show that alternative in practice is precisely what needs to happen. Thank you. I, I, I do want to point out that the United Nations has a, a special advisor um, a, to fight against this kind of religious incitement, and it is a multi-faith group. There's a steering committee of religious leaders that advise the um, United Nations special advisor, and um, Professor Karam and I sit on that steering committee, and we are in seven different regions around the world standing united all the religions together to say, 
we don't accept incitement here on our watch. And only when all the religions stand together do we have enough power to oppose those who literally are there with guns in their hands. We are coming to the close of our hour, and I, I, I want to apologize because I literally have a list of another dozen wonderful questions from everyone. Um, inshallah, Professor Karam, there will be another opportunity for people to engage you. But I do want to say as thank you that um, one of the things that is clear to me is that I will sleep better tonight knowing that you are at the helm of Religions for Peace, that I think all of us can rest assured that you are incredibly thoughtful, you are analytic, that you see the global scale, and you are putting us all to work. And I, I want to take this opportunity to accept that charge you put upon us, that it's incumbent on everyone on this call to go out and meet with your interreligious colleagues, with your multi-faith colleagues, and figure out what's the next project we're going to do. Uh, surely it can be COVID. It can be giving out masks. It can be making sure people first get tested and then, God willing, soon, inshallah, get vaccines. Um, but there is much work to do on COVID, on global warming. The list is almost endless. But as it says in a wonderful second century rabbinic text, it's not upon us to complete the task. But that doesn't mean we can avoid it. So thank you, Professor Karam, and thank you all for being on this John Paul II lecture on interfaith understanding. God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much.